everyone gets a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. Leonie Rosenstiel is a woman on a mission. After her elderly mother could no longer care for herself, she was placed in a guardianship. That's a court-appointed designation giving another person the power to make decisions for someone who is unable to act independently. And suddenly, with the courts in the picture, Leonie's life changed. Her story is one of navigating an old boy's and old girl's legal labyrinth that blocked her access to her beloved mother. It cost her mother's estate a small fortune, and none of this was intended when Leonie set off to be sure her mother was safe. She's written a book about her experience called Protecting Mama, Surviving the Legal Guardianship Swamp, and she now advocates for better education about guardianship decisions. Please welcome Leonie to Bump in the Road. Leonie, welcome to Bump in the Road. If you would, tell us your story. Well, this particular story started around 2001, 2002, when my mother started getting confused, forgetting things. Then finally, I walked in one day to take her to lunch, and there was blood all over the kitchen, and she was standing there just staring at the wall. There was a phone next to her. She could have called for help. She was not making any moves. She just looked as if she was in another time dimension, and nothing was happening. I got her to urgent care. She needed 17 stitches. And to put her thumb back together, basically, she had thought she was cutting food, but there was no food anywhere near her. And this put me on absolute notice that my mother, who had been uh, so intelligent, she'd been a college professor. She, at one point during World War II, supervised a thousand whacks in the South Pacific who were cracking codes. I mean, she was brilliant and she could not function mentally anymore. I had to make sure somebody was with her all the time after that incident. And so I began to realize there was a serious problem there. Approximately the same time period, just a little bit later, my husband went into the final stages of Parkinson's. So both of my closest loved ones had dementia at the same time, which was a horrible situation I hope no one else ever gets into. But they were living in different places. My husband and I had a house. My mother had a house about two miles away, which in New Mexico is practically next door. So I'd been seeing her all the time, uh, several times a week at least, and talking to her on the phone. But this was a real wake-up call. I then discovered that she did not understand what a checkbook was for. One of the people I had um, contracted with to help her through a, through a service took me aside one day and said, I'm not really supposed to talk about money with you, but I have to tell you, I haven't been paid in three weeks. So I said, I, I said I'd take care of it. And I uh, next uh, the next time I had my mother alone, I went and got her checkbook because I didn't want to embarrass her. And I said, Mama, you know, um, probably it's time for you to pay some bills. And she looked at the checkbook that I'd put in her hand and she said, what's this? I said, it's your checkbook, Mama. She said, well, what do I do with it? I said, you pay bills with it. And she said, how do I do that? And I thought, Houston, we've got a problem. So that was what started me on trying to consult my family attorney. And he said, I've got an attorney in the firm who's just perfect for you. She's our elder care go-to person. She's the expert. 
And he introduced me to her, and that was the beginning of a 14-year ordeal. Um, I think she entirely misunderstood what I was trying to do, and that's being kind. Her idea was that I wanted a divorce from my mother, and I didn't care to see her again in this lifetime. I never said that to her. I never said that to anybody. And she arranged it so that I almost didn't see my mother again. And I had to fight with her and with the courts. Uh, Took almost three years until I saw Mama again. The first year, the court had appointed a guardian because she had made arrangements without telling me. She said she was my attorney. She told the court she was my attorney. But she had actually made arrangements with the uh, what they considered to be the other side because we have an adversarial court system in this country uh, that someone else would take over uh, my mother's legal guardianship and conservatorship. And so... Uh, This became an issue, and I didn't see my mother for almost three years. The first year we got their report of the guardian, which is kind of a standard procedure. They report to the the court every year on the status of what they call their ward, or their protected person is their preferred term now. Uh, And I looked at the report, and the report was absolutely chock full of things that were not true. So I called up my attorney and said to her, I need to lodge some protests with the court because this needs to be changed. It's full of inaccuracies. And I don't want the court to have a misperception of the facts here. And she said, I can't lodge any protests. I said, well, why not? She said, well, I already signed off on the report approving it. I said, how could you do that? I, at that point, they were sending the stuff out by mail because it was that long ago. And I had just opened the packet and, and read the report. She said, um, gee, you know, uh, I signed off on it for your mother. I said, I thought you were my attorney. She said, well, I'm your mother's attorney, too. I said, well, gee, isn't that a conflict of interest? She said, I resign. So then I was without an attorney. And I had to go scrambling to look for one. And it was horrible. It was a hor- that was a horrible experience, too, because I was re- we were all really comfortable using the same law firm. But apparently, it was not working in my best interests. And so I needed to find an attorney. I found an attorney who basically said, I will try and protect you from the court system. I will not take an active role against these other people because we're basically friends. And so she did her best to not allow me to be totally destroyed by the court system while at the same time not advocating as well as some other people might have for my interests. So when you got into this relationship with this lawyer, um, did you have a clear vision of what you wanted out of that? And how, how did things go so terribly awry? Well, I had had my mother's power of attorney for the previous nine years after my father passed away. And so I had been doing all of her investing. I had I had her investment account that I had power of attorney over and her checking accounts. And uh, she had been doing the day-to-day work until her mind quit on her. And I didn't have a problem with that until she no longer understood what a check was. And then it became dangerous for her to have one around because anybody could come in and tell her to sign something and she would have no idea what she was signing. So I had actually been doing more and more of that work over time as she was less and less interested in it. Um, what basically happened was that there was a there is a large group of people. There are like 40 
um, members of the guardianship association in this state. And it's basically like a revolving door. Sometimes they work for the state. Sometimes they work independently. They'll, they'll go off and do their own thing for a few years. And if that doesn't work out, they'll be right back doing work for the state. So everybody is very buddy-buddy. And the attorneys who work with them are all the same attorneys. And for a long, long time, this may have changed a little bit now. For, I don't know, maybe 50 years before that, um, the same, it was, it was like a repertory company, basically, like a, like a stage company where people changed roles. And if you looked at the court agendas at the court rosters, you would see the same person was a court visitor one day, a guardian the next day, um, guardian ad litem the third day. And they just kind of apportioned these little jobs out to each other. And of course, they always got paid for them. The only role that didn't automatically change in name was the attending the doctor who was called, but they had favorite doctors who would say whatever they wanted them to say. And so, so did, what the court, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm just wondering, what? did you know what guardianship was when you first approached this first attorney? Um, I was trying to protect my mother and I knew that she couldn't protect herself. And when I said that, I said, you know, she's, she's had this incident where she nearly, you know, she could have bled to death if they didn't sew her up. She was just yeah. bleeding all over the place. And then she doesn't know what a checkbook is anymore. And so she's in danger both fi- both uh, personally and financially. And she said, well, it sounds like she really needs a guardianship. Because gotcha. she can't can't be left alone on either level, and that was quite true. She needed someone to make major decisions for her, and so uh, that was what that was when it started. Well, the only thing we can really do is start a guardianship proceeding, and then everything got totally derailed. Uh, Mama, one of the things that you learn in this process is that. The state has a hierarchy of people who have an, quote unquote, an interest in the case. And so they are looking for relatives. Now, my mother had disinherited all her relatives years before, and that had always been true. I'd known that since I was like 10 years old. Didn't mean we didn't see them. It just meant she, nobody was going to leave them any money. Well, I had a younger cousin who believed that my mother should leave her everything and had asked my mother to do that some years before. And my mother had said no. And she had gone back to the East Coast because we, Al- we were in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and had not seen my mother again for four years. She and her mother, my aunt, uh, had gone back. And I hadn't seen them. Mama hadn't seen them. Suddenly, I'm getting a call from my cousin that I'm doing something terrible, and my mother is fine. Well, my mother's not fine. I know she's not fine. And it later seemed to have turned out from the from the discovery records that I got in in the court case that. My cousin was trying to get my mother's will changed even after she was incapacitated. So it was it was a problem, and it was nothing I was aware was still on the back burner with my cousin. But it caused a lot of trouble because they ended up getting my mother a an attorney, another attorney, not the attorney that was actually the guardian's attorney. Um, there was yet another attorney brought into the mix, and he turned out to be the attorney who defended all the priests who were accused of pedophilia in New Mexico. And that really upset me. I, I can't tell you why it upset me, but it did. It was just they've, they've got this attorney who is somewhat questionable. 
And the attorney who said she was my attorney had a meeting with the other side without telling me and made an arrangement for what they were going to do in court, which I don't think is exactly how it's supposed to go down either. But my understanding is it happens that way very frequently. This is Uh, chilling. Oh, it's scary. It's scary like you wouldn't believe. And I didn't know it was happening until I saw the records after Mamba passed away. And I I sued on behalf of her estate because I I was what they call in most states the executrix, but in New Mexico they call it the personal representative. And I sued to find out what the devil happened. And I discovered they had had a group meeting and they had made all these arrangements in advance of the court hearing. And I didn't know about it. So, uh, yeah, this happens to a lot of people. Do you give up all your um, family and um, legal ties when somebody enters a guardianship? I didn't, although after the hearing, the attorney who had said she was my attorney but really wasn't came over to me and said, congratulations, you're now divorced. I said, I never had any intention of being divorced from my mother. She said, all you have to do is come back and collect the money. I said, that was never my intention. Boy, that's a system out of control. What, you know, I, I've heard you tell a story about what can happen to a family business when um, a guardianship situation arises. Would you tell that story? Because it is something that people need to hear and be aware of. Absolutely. Okay, there's a family business. This happens a lot. Um, Maybe there are two or three children, and there's an elder who has 51% control of the business because that's a frequent occurrence that the elder still wants to maintain control. Well, something happens, and a situation like happened in my family happens in that family. The elder... Uh, loses control of their mental faculties, and really can't run the business anymore. But through some set of events, very much like the one in my family, um, somehow an outside person is appointed by the court as the guardian and conservator. Now, because of the way the laws are set up and structured, the person who is the guardian or the conservator, whatever it is in that state that has control of the finances, that person now has a 51% control of the family business. Oh, my gosh. Very often often those people have no concept of what that business is. They don't know how it's run. They don't know what the assumptions are that are made financially within the business. And they have an absolute right to have the business liquidated. What, um, that, that's just stunning. What about a will? Doesn't a will and a power of attorney, doesn't that have any standing? Well, I had a power of attorney. I had a power of attorney. And when my mother was being influenced by the people who wanted to become the guardian, um, and my mother's mental faculties had already failed her. Uh, They convinced her to say that she didn't want me as power of attorney, but she wanted them to help her. In other words, they misinformed her, to put it politely. Well, you're so vulnerable. Oh, you you have so little recourse. And you don't know what it is that's going to happen. I mean, I had no clue. When it came time and my husband was in a situation where he was in a nursing home and he had lost his ability to reason, um, I asked my second attorney, that was a later later time period, I asked my second attorney, what can I do? And she said, I'll send my assistant up to the nursing home with the right papers for you to sign. The assistant came into the lobby of the nursing home She handed me the papers. I looked at those papers and I burst into tears. They were the same papers I'd signed for my mother. 
I said, oh I can't gosh. sign these. I will never do this again. Now, shouldn't, um, you know, in the case of a family business, for example, chances are you have a, a lawyer on retainer or a lawyer, lawyer you use for business matters, um, and you certainly have done some estate planning. Doesn't the estate planning overrule this guardianship situation? No. <laughs> let me tell let me tell you my horror story about a patriarch who did absolutely everything right. Um there was the owner of a large ranch in southern New Mexico. And he had two sets of kids with two different wives, and his eldest son, he got to run the ranch, and he put the ranch into a trust. And the trust was functioning just fine. Everybody got, you know, their share of the profits from the ranch. It was a very profitable ranch. And everything was fine for a number of years. Finally, the patriarch had a terrible accident, ended up in the hospital unconscious. And his son, who was also the trustee, said, oh, my gosh, the hospital called and said, my dad's not going to survive this, and that I better get the family together. Maybe I should call an attorney. And at that point, everything had been functioning just fine. There had been no legal problems for a number of years. And the original attorney who drew up the trust had re had uh, retired. And so he picked up at that point, it was the phone book. This happened about 20 years ago. Picked up the phone book, found only one advertisement in the phone book for an estate attorney. Uh, she was working about 200 miles from where the ranch was, had no knowledge of the family, no knowledge of the circumstances. He called her and he said, uh, she confirmed, yeah, I'm an estate attorney. What, you know, what's your what's your problem? And he said, well, he had this trust and his dad was in the hospital and wasn't expected to survive. She, she said exactly what the attorney said to me. I'll be right down. I know exactly what you all should sign. And I'll have the papers down there for you. I'll come down on an emergency basis so that I'll meet you at the hospital. And she did. Met them at the hospital. They signed the papers. They attended to their father. Their father died about two days later. Um, next thing they find out, the trustee discovers the ranch is for sale and he no longer has a job. And the estate is about to be uh, dispersed. It's going to go to the beneficiaries. The, the cash from the proceeds of the sale of everything that he owns and that his father owned is going to all the beneficiaries on an equal basis. And that's the end of the entire process. It He's, sounds like there's some financial motive involved here, too. I mean, how do these people get paid? Is it a percent of assets like a uh, financial planner? Uh, this is an hourly uh, attorney that's working now. Okay. And it's hourly for working for the estate hourly. And you're going to love the denouement of this one because you would never guess. I didn't either until I saw the deposition of the attorney in the court case that the ex-trustee brought against her. But he had a couple of processes he went through first. First, he went to the attorney. He said, what the devil are you doing? You know, this was a family ranch. My father set it up in trust so that everybody would always have provision for what they needed. And everybody always did. So why are you selling it? And she said, it's the right thing to do. And he said, that wasn't what my father wanted. So he went to the Bar Association thinking that she had done something uh, improper ethically. And the Bar Association backed her up, and he was just mystified and horrified and angry, and he took her to court. Well, in her deposition, and she tried to explain this to him before, but he just couldn't comprehend it. Um, in her deposition, she said, he hired me on behalf of the trust. We learn in law school the purpose of a trust is to be 
dispersed to be distributed to the beneficiaries. That's the purpose of a trust. It's held in trust until such time as it's distributed. And she said that was a good time to distribute the trust. But um, if he had hired me as an individual, I would have given him advice about what was best for him as an individual. If he had been paying me as an individual, I'd have given him entirely different advice. How do you like that one? I'm, I'm, I have to pick my jaw up off the ground. It, it's just, <laughs> it is appalling. Uh, how have, how, now, how has this experience in your life, having to deal with this, how has it changed your life? Well, I'm not trusting the courts all that much. <laughs> I have not had a good experience. I have had some really good experiences in court and some really terrible experiences in court. I have come to the conclusion that things that are secret are dangerous. These hearings, all the guardianship hearings, are can are conducted in the strictest secrecy. It's very rare that they allow anyone else in. They usually don't hold them in an open courtroom. Uh, they don't put people under oath. They don't swear them in. Uh, I was basically not allowed to give any testimony to contradict what the uh, other side was saying at various points. And they had some real whoppers in the court record. I mean, it was just crazy. So uh, we need a real hearing. We need open proceedings. We don't need that. They lock away the transcripts of the um, of of the proceedings and all of the pleadings. They want to lock away, and they don't want to let anyone see them. Now, isn't that setting a stage for all kinds of shenanigans? And my answer is, you bet it is. So you wrote a book about this. I sure did. I wrote the book <laughs> Protecting Mama, which <laughs> is the story of what happened with my mother. And it also ties in to the game plan. You can see step by step how they use people and manipulate people to get the result that they want. And it's usually a minimum of $50,000 a year that goes to the guardian for just being the guardian. So it's not a negligible amount of money. And even with indigent people, even people who have no money, they get paid by the state for, for taking care of them. And so uh, very often those people come with $10,000 or more a month in what are called disability waivers, which is income that they're supposed to be living off of. One of the most awful cases I heard of was a firm that acted for people with veterans' pensions and disability waivers and stole their money. They would put these people in like $1,000 a month housing, and then the other $9,000 a month went into their pocket. Ultimately, they got caught because of an insider who went to the FBI. And they ended, the people who were the principals in that firm ended up in federal prison. But this doesn't happen often enough. It should happen much more frequently. <laughs> well, you've become kind they of had a... No, they had ahead. hundreds of, no, they had hundreds of wards. This wasn't a, you know, a one-off deal. They had hundreds of people they were supposedly caring for. This has become a bit of a mission for you, hasn't it? It, you bet it has. <laughs> <laughs> I have some... gotten very, very active in this. What are some of the things you're doing? Well, I have created a course and a summit for people to try to explain to them what can happen to them. And what happened to me was even worse than I just described to you, because it took five years after my mother passed away for me to get my freedom of speech back so I could speak to you about this. And I was at one point offered $5 million not to say anything. <laughs> Any regrets over not taking that? <laughs> no. <laughs> As now, you, you can hear, I like to talk. <laughs> Well, 
you know, it, so, it sounds to me like there are parts of the infrastructure, if you will, the brokers, the financial planners, and some of the estate turn- attorneys that may benefit from some education on this. I am hoping to do that. In fact, I'm in the process of talking to a firm that does this kind of work and has uh, correspondence with legal firms all over the country. At one point, my last attorney, who was very close to sainthood as far as I'm concerned, wanted to develop a course with me, but he died at the beginning of COVID, and we did not ever have that happen. But uh, yes, they need education. And there's something that happens in the financial industry that is a bit concerning as well. Even when there is a um, an account and they're concerned about the ability of someone to manage that account, they are required to report it. But they report simultaneously to everybody who's uh, involved. And the state is one of the entities they must report to if they have a question about the mental capacity of someone who owns an account. So at the same time that they report to the state, they will report to whoever, if there's someone listed as a as an interested party on the account, they'll report to that person as well. But if that person lives in another state, it so frequently happens that the children and the parents are not living in the same state. The person, the, the group that gets there first will be the state. And uh, I saw that happen to someone in New Mexico. He was living in New York. He was working in New York. And he began to be concerned about his mother. And he came back to New Mexico. And before he could do anything, the state had appointed a guardian for her. And it took him three years to get the guardianship back from the state. Because they said, well, you don't live here. You're not a resident. You're a city boy now. (laughs) And they wouldn't give it to him. These stories are just chilling. If you could leave people with, say, three pieces of advice when they're faced with a situation where they have a, um, a failing elder, where they're not quite with it anymore, what would you tell them to do? I would tell them to make everything clear to everybody before they have a failing elder. Um, The only way that you can legally decide where someone's going to live is if you have legal decision-making capability. The only way you can legally decide where someone's going to be treated for medical conditions is if you have legal authority to do that. Uh, But before that, there are people who... um, you know, they're having this argument with their parents, you better tell me what to do in case, or you need to give me a power of attorney. And the elder says, I don't want to deal with that. Well, that's a decision too. And if there's a group of adult children, they then become the people who need to make the decisions in advance of need. Because when you're in an emergency, it is the worst possible time to make life-altering decisions. You need to do that, if possible, upstream. And that's what I try to do with my course in my summit, is to give people tools so that they can assess who is the best person to do what within the family structure. Can you trust that person? I have a friend who had a brother who never fulfilled his commitments. And when it came time for the father to need a guardian and a conservator, um, he said, well, I'll be the guardian. And he didn't do the job. And she became the conservator. But she couldn't get medical information out of the institution where the father was. That's a personal function, not a financial function. Isn't that nice? uh, So anybody facing this has to be sure they have an attorney on their side, not somebody who's looking to set up a a guardianship. Well, 
uh, sometimes you absolutely need to have what's called a guardianship because the person can't take care of themselves. Mm-hmm. But you need to understand that you need a law firm that's on your side. You need to know that they're actually working for your interests and they're not buddy buddy with the other side. And there's there's a there's a huge problem here because attorneys are ethically required to treat each other cordially. Even if they hate each other's guts, they're going to treat each other cordially. And so sometimes it's hard to distinguish between politeness and uh, being in the other person's camp. But you have to be able to trust your attorney. And I have I have a long litany of horror stories of people who really couldn't trust their attorney. They went to the attorney because he was famous. They went to the attorney because he had political power in the state of New Mexico. I know somebody who <laughs> went to the uh, one of the major leaders in in the legislature and got it in the neck because. Uh, do you know the movie My Cousin Vinny? I think everybody should watch that movie. You know, I saw it years ago, but it, it isn't fresh in my mind. Uh, okay, it's an it's an old comedy, and it has to do with a bumbling attorney who ends up trying to represent a relative of his in a law case in a place he's not familiar with. And he's going to win because by the law of ethics uh, or the rule of ethics in the legal profession, uh, you must tell your opposing counsel the truth if they ask a question. And so he gets, he, he knows how to get that information from the other side and he can win. Now the reverse is also true. If you have a bunch of people who are in cahoots against you, uh, they'll either not give your attorney the truth. I, I was in a situation where that was done several times to my attorney, but he was wise to it. If you're wise to it, you do your own research. And so you need to know whose work your attorney is using. If he's using the work that was given to him by the other side and they're not ethical, you're going to get a very, very poor result. What is your website and how can people find you? Uh, my website is Dayspring Resources, all one word, dayspringresources.com. And they can take a look at the free stuff on there. There's a lot of free stuff on there. And there's some paid information that it cost me about a million and a half dollars to amass because I'm that serious about trying to get the word out. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll support this podcast by becoming a Bump2 subscriber. Buy us a cup of coffee. It's your support that makes this podcast and website possible. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life.